Doug. Letting everybody in. Welcome everybody. We'll get going here in just a minute. There's some few more folks in the waiting room. Showing up literally on time. The way to hang in there. Uh oh, I don't even know if I should let that Jason Havens in. Oh, okay, I will. Oh, was that recorded? Oh, sorry. Welcome, everybody. So welcome to this uh, session. This is Farm Brewing P Past, Present, and Future. We want to thank Magliner as our day's sponsor of, of all of the sessions happening today. Uh, we appreciate everybody um, being here. I think that this is going to be an interesting conversation, and, and it's one that we have um, a lot during the Farm Brewing Committee. So I'm super excited for the three folks that we have actually um, leading this conversation. Uh, I'll start with Ted Hawley, who is the owner of New York Craft Malt. Um, Ted, uh, no offense here, but you're one of the old dogs in this uh, in terms of malting. You've been, you've been doing your, you've opened your malt house in the very early days. Um, um, you know, one of the originals, the OGs, one of the OGs in New York. So thank you, Ted, for, for being a part of this conversation. Chris Holden with the New York Hop Guild, which I'm learning more and more about. Um, they're doing some really exciting stuff um, and uh, with hops. Um, and so Chris, thank you for being a part of this as well. And then Jason Saylor with Strong Rope Brewery, uh, who is on the NYSBA Board of Directors and also chair of the um, Farm Brewing Committee that we have in the New York State Brewers Association. And what I think is really great about Jason, and I think everybody on here probably knows, but if you don't, you know, he walks the walk with his beer. Um, he uh, is in the heart of Brooklyn and uh, is 100% New York farm, everything that he does. And he's very passionate about it. And um, if you haven't had his beers, you're missing out. You should. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to you, Jason, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, your perspective on the farm brewing law and, and how it's, you know, how you've navigated it, how, how through the years has, has, it, has it worked for you? Yeah, um, I mean, so for us, when we first, when I first started uh, kind of jumping into the, uh, you know, the idea of opening a brewer as a home brewer, since about 2001, um, around 2011, started playing around with the idea of opening and, you know, the, the farm brewery license uh, kind of came into existence uh, shortly thereafter. Um, and so from from day one, we, we decided that uh, we wanted to uh, become a, a farm brewery uh, and, and work uh, with New York Ingredients. And it was uh, soon after that we started developing the business plan and that model that we actually wanted to, uh, you know, really focus uh, to the point of, of being exclusive uh, with New York Ingredients uh, for our beers. Um, you know, it took a little while for us to get going. Uh, we eventually opened in 2015. Um, but in that meantime, we, we played around with as much local, uh, or I played around with as much local ingredients as possible, uh, you know, tr in my home brews, uh, testing out things, working uh, and meeting with producers, and uh, both Ted and uh, Chris were, uh, you know, some of those, those early people as I was reaching out, because, you know, the, the thing is that since it was so new and since you know there was nothing there was no infrastructure uh around which you know obviously the farm uh, brewery license was meant to uh kind of uh create uh it, you know it was a lot of figuring things out you know i when we first were ready to open and really get going and and needed to get our supplies uh you know our inventory for that it was you know, reaching out to every hop farmer I could find. And that was just scouring the internet. There was, there wasn't a real great, there was one map uh, that someone had created as part of like, I think like a Cornell ag thing uh, that I was able to kind of like use and cross-reference and then try to look up on Facebook and Google and, you know, and then just like hey, call them. And I think I reached out to like 30 different farms and was like, Hey, do you have hops? And like, what do you have? And 
Uh, you know, Chris was, uh, you know, one of the the few that that got, uh, you know, got to me at that point. And uh, even Ted, I think we had actually reached out, you know, as we were homebrewing uh, and had been trying to uh, work with our, you know, his stuff, but we were also uh, reaching out to uh, Pioneer uh, Mall Team, which was in Rochester and is no longer in existence, I believe. Uh, we worked worked with uh, we were working with Andrea because she was uh, in Valley Malt in Massachusetts. You know, eventually for us, it was a, an idea that we wanted to stick with producers and growers that were New York based um, to kind of really uh, live and, and stick with the hundred percent. But it was a it was a lot of uh, you know it was a lot of uh, trial and error back then. So, but uh, you know one of the best things that we could do was have uh, you know guys like uh, Ted and Chris that we could uh, you know shoot back and forth and and you know work directly with you know um, so you know you know Ted what was it like for you you had uh, you know you you were the oldest out of all of us in this uh, game so you were saying. I Sorry, before we get to Ted, because I want to set this up a little bit, because you, you okay. bring up a good question, Jason. I think I'm jumping ahead for those that don't really know. And Chris Erickson is on here, um, and he might have been involved. The, the New York farm law actually happened before I was even hired. So like the evolution of it and, the, and everything that took place in those conversations, you know, I still don't know, know much about. But I only want to bring this up before we go to Ted, um, is that, you know, when this law was passed, there were no malt houses in New York state, right? This was, that's what everybody has to understand. Like this wasn't a thing. Um, and so uh, Valley Malt was in Massachusetts and then um, Country Malt in Canada. So I think that's where, and some people, a lot of people ask today, it's like, why are we sending our barley out to get malted out of state? Well, because there was nobody to do it at the beginning of this. And so I just wanted to set up, and I, and I don't know, Chris, at some point, if you wanna jump in and talk about those at, at some point during the conversation, I think people might be interested but sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to set that up because Ted, then then you come in and you see this opportunity, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, in 2011, I attended a, a NOFA conference, a Northeast Organic Farming Association conference uh, uh, that we were, were a member of. And I was looking to uh, I grow some organic grains for the market. And, um, and there was a segment that I took that was from uh, from uh, farm to bakery, uh, the segment. And the, the facilitator, Glenda Neff at the time, had one sentence, if there's any entrepreneurs out there, there's a need for malting grains for the brewing industry. And then she went on with her spiel. And then, and that was in 2011. And I started a dialogue with her and started doing my own research, uh, mostly in 2011, finding out that there was no off the shelf craft malting equipment anywhere. There wasn't any uh, New York grains malting, malt grade uh, barley grown in New York State. Um, uh, Klaus Martins did have some down in his neck of the woods. Andrea, of course, uh, Valley Malt is the uh, pioneers in the area, opened up a couple years before I did. Uh, but uh, I, I was committed before the farm license uh, came into effect. At the time, it was killed uh, in, in 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 the uh, uh, Congress there. Uh, then it came back from with um, I think Schumer might have pushed it. No, that that wasn't Schumer, but anyway, uh, we were in we were we were committed to it before the farm brewing license um, uh, came in effect. And of course, uh, you know that, that was a big plus uh, for us. Uh, I was on Governor Cuomo's Barley Initiative Committee. Uh, that was before, that was just when the license started to grab a hold. And we had a room in Albany of some uh, growers, distillers, brewers, uh, and, uh, and Cornell was in there as well, discussing, uh, you know, what's, how are we going to grow this industry? Where do they, where does New York put their money? Uh, but I was very uh, fortunate and, and honored to be on that committee and being the start of this whole resurgence. Uh, it, it's been a, it's been a great ride. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you, you mentioned was that there was no, uh, there was no craft malting equipment, but, you know, when you first jumped in, there was also no uh, barley of malting quality at that time, really, either. I mean, maybe a little bit, but, 
what, what was that challenge like in terms of working or kind of helping with the farmers or developing? And did you grow your any of your own or were you just uh, trying to find other farmers to do it? Well, knowing that I needed a crop first uh, before I even got the equipment ordered, uh, I had a, a local grower down the road here. Uh, he was all, uh, we found some Conlon. Uh, uh, it was its spring variety. We So we got that in the ground because then I knew I had my my uh, my my uh, base grains available, but we grew it like wheat, put too, put too much nitrogen on it, of course, and spiked the protein. And uh, it, it the beginning stages, once we started talking about that, that was a rough go in the beginning of all this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And then uh, Chris, you, you kind of came at it, a, a, you know, a little, little differently. Um, you know, you were like originally thinking of, uh, uh, doing a brewery yourself is that correct yeah we uh we were doing a lot of home brewing 2010 2011 and uh we were at the state fair and we saw the the big um thing i think it was either cornell or cornell cooperative extension had put a big thing up about um the farm brewers license there that year so we kind of started looking into it about a year later we uh uh, we decided we we're going to grow some hops and we started doing everything about late 2013 and really got going at it in 2014. And what was the biggest, what were you seeing? What were the challenges at that point? I mean, you know, because you were, you were jumping in, you know, obviously hops there were, you know, New York was one of the largest hop growing regions, but there were only a handful of uh, farmers at that point, at, you know, uh, when you, when you started um, Rick Peterson and a couple others, but like, how was that? Did you, were you trying to figure that out on your own? Were you contacting them? Like what, what were you figuring out for your own property and soil and all that? Yeah, it was a little bit of everything. There was a lot of misdirection, I think, and uh, understanding of, uh, you know, farming here in New York compared to other places. A lot of people would compare, you know, our growing region to, you know, Yakima, Washington and you know, the, you couldn't get any more vast differences in, in growing regions. So I think that, you know, trying to talk to different people, we, we reached out a lot to Larry Fisher up at Foothills Hops and uh, uh, a little bit with Rick and uh, worked with some of the, the vineyard guys on, you know, stuff for, you know, fertilizers and sprays and everything. And it worked out pretty well. Um, but yeah, it just, there wasn't a lot of organization there at the start. Uh, I mean, the Northeast Hop Alliance is doing a great job. They were kind of like the leading role in that. Uh, but I think when it came down to the commercial setting of that, it was, it was difficult. I think everybody was trying to figure it out on their own and everybody had their own opinions on how to do everything, you know, better, I guess. And then also, you know, with New York being so vastly different, you know, you've got, I don't know, I would say that, you know, we consider there being five to six different growing regions just in New York State for hops. I'm sure, Ted, you've, you know, we, you know, I've heard you talk about that in the past with the grain. There's just, there's so many different growing regions here, which is a good thing, um, but it's also, it can be challenging, you know, trying to share those ideas with, you know, say myself and Rick Peterson. We're totally different areas of the state, even though we're only a couple hours away from each other. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it all comes down to the different growing styles and, and what you can and can't do and, and how you can treat your soil and, and what you can do with it. So you said that, uh, you know, New York people were kind of trying to make that original comparison of to like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, if, if we're not like Pacific Northwest, are, is there any place that you can compare it to, 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 to get a frame of reference in terms of growing? Yeah, I think... Uh, it's kind of like a hybrid between like say Germany and we'll say New Zealand, uh, New Zealand, because of where we're at latitude wise, Germany is so much farther North. So their day length is, uh, much, much, much longer during the growing, growing season. When it comes to soil and, and how much, uh, you know, rainfall that we get, you know, across the entire state, I would say it's more, more towards like that German style, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, Washington's a desert you know, or at least in that growing region, it's a desert. So it's, it's difficult to be able to compare those two places. Um, Washington, if you don't have water, you, you know, stop, nothing's going to grow here in New York. I mean, I mean, let's face it, you could spit on something and you're going to get something to grow. Nice. I'll remember that one. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, you know, for you know, for for us, the I think the the biggest challenge, uh, you know, getting going back then was was learning how to work with with these ingredients. You know, um, you know, we were because we were doing as much malt. We didn't have uh, roasted uh, stuff, uh, much roasted stuff. Uh, Valley was playing around a little bit, um, but really it was it was it was getting the base malts down and, and, and figuring out, uh, you know, how, how they worked in our system and how they uh, worked in our beers. And since we were predominantly making, uh, you know, English and American style ales, you know, there was a lot of focus on, on those base ingredients as the, uh, um, you know, as the driver uh, for, for the flavor profiles. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, as, as you, you know, some of, you know, as we were figuring things out, you know, for the malt side of things, uh, you, you mentioned, Ted, that you started with Conlon uh, on some of the stuff, but the, you know, the seeds have, have been an issue uh, and, you know, getting the, 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 the seed companies to provide the same seeds season in and season out. And like, so that's going to, that's, that shifted and then that shifted how you malted and that shifted what we got in the end and how it uh, affected our beer. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that at all and like, you know, what you've done to try to hopefully kind of push past that, uh, or at least get some stability in the product, um, so that it gets to the end user in, in a state that we kind of are good with. Yeah. And I just step back a little bit of what, uh, Chris mentioned, uh, New York state is a hotbed of microclimates. I mean, we're all over the state is, is different, you know? New York geographically is quite diverse and large. Uh, you could have one variety growing well in our region, then Hudson Valley it won't even come out of the ground. It's, it's quite interesting what we have going on in New York State here. And uh, uh, yeah, in the beginning, the Conlin and then uh, Endeavor, and but we, we had to educate the growers on how to grow it. Uh, malting barley is something uh, that had left the state 100 years ago. And uh, for good reason, as in hops, the, the Q-serum headlight came in, of course. But so, but we have a lot of uh, different uh, opportunities with uh, fungicides and uh, insecticides and things uh, to combat some of the some of the uh, Mother Nature's wrath. But uh, varieties have been an, an issue uh, with the seed companies. There's one, two, maybe three one particular major seed company that uh, everybody looks to get seed from. And every year they were changing it up. And we could, you know, we did well with, uh, you know, with Endeavor and uh, the next year it would be gone. And then, then we had uh, Wint Malt and then we had, uh, that's why uh, Synergy and, and uh, uh, a few others that Every year, we're, we we find out that we don't have the same grain. So, as a maltster, uh, we we have to manipulate that grain. Uh, we have to learn it fairly quickly and what uh, you know how uh, uh, how it absorbs moisture, uh, how it grows. We can manipulate those things with temperature and water, temperature and air. Uh, but uh, you guys want the same product all the time. Uh, of course, for your beers. And so it's been a challenge on the variety side of the, the grains uh, and uh, Mother Nature. I mean, some years we have a really nice, you know, 764 or larger kernel and other years it's a drought. Uh, also, you know, growing, Cornell has been very good with, uh, you know, they've come a long ways from, I've seen them not have a, a program at all for malting barley to now they have their own bread, uh, uh, inbred New York State variety that will hopefully be uh, uh, great for our region. But uh, we've come a long ways from uh, uh, marginal malting barleys available and that uh, we had to try to to malt them on our new equipment and educate ourselves. It's, we've come a long ways in the, in the, in the past. Uh, you know, uh, we got, you know, all the maltsters, we have a learning curve on how to malt, how to use our equipment, how to, how to play with those grains and manipulate them to create a good base malt or other malts. So uh, we, <clears throat> that's the past, present, uh, it's, it's night and day right now. So Ethan has a good question since we're on this topic. Go ahead, Ethan.
Sure. I got it. Um, yeah, I just thought it'd be cool to talk a little bit about uh, two things that I know you're both uh, familiar with, or across the three of you are. Um, one is that what you just mentioned, Ted, the, 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 the development of the uh, Excelsior Gold um, barley variety and what we can expect out of that um, as brewers. And then also what's going on in parallel in terms of uh, hop varietal development, because I know um, there's all kinds of research going on about that, but I don't really know the current current state of it. Um, well, we're, we're doing past, present, and future. So I guess we're done with the past. <laughs> present right now. Uh, <clears throat> the, the future is, is that varietal of uh, Excelsior Gold. Uh, we, it's not mass produced yet. Uh, I was going to put it on the future, but uh, Cornell has been working diligently on, on uh, uh, breeding uh, a grain, a malting barley for our region. And they're, they're now breeding also a variety. That's a spring variety. Uh, and uh, they're, they're working on a winter variety now as well. But uh, there's not enough of that barley right now as they They've spent a lot of time and money. Dan Sweeney uh, has developed it uh, in, in Mark Schorl's uh, uh, labs. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, it'll be a great grain uh, to grow and yield well for the farmers, malt well in the malt house, and you guys love it. Uh, but we're still a little early on that. Uh, there's not enough out there yet. It was propagated last year. Uh, I think they had like eight acres in, maybe a little more. Uh, it's propagated now. It's not widely uh, available yet for for mass use. Is is that is that something that I would probably see mostly becoming base grain, uh, either uh, pale pale malt or pilsner? Or would that also be good for making your specialty uh, roasts and stuff? I would have to say all of the above. It's it's how we work it in the malt house. Uh, uh, I, I, too a little too early, but uh, I'm going to have to say uh, I think we can make uh, most anything out of it. Yeah, from from a brewer's side of things, you know, we we've talked to to Mark and the Cornell team about trying to to get even just the smallest amounts in so that we can kind of start playing with it to give any feedback. Um, you know, we have they we don't have enough yet to to do that. Um, I'm hoping maybe uh, you know early next year or so, or like maybe even something late this year, but like, I, you know, I want to be able to get that in um, and give as much feedback uh, as possible to, to the malt houses like Ted and Dennis and whoever else is uh, looking to, uh, to take it, Murmuration or Bob and Niagara. Like, I, I think, I think getting them the feedback because the farm, it could go great on the farm um, and then have to, you know, until it gets into the brew house, uh, I really want to, you know, I think it's, I, I mean, I'm extremely excited about it. I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll get a lot of, uh, you know, it, it'll become uh, the start of something awesome that is, you know, homegrown and, and local and, and does well in our climates, uh, all the different microclimates in New York. Um, but, but, you know, in the end, it, 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 it needs to get into the brew house. It needs to get, gets in your hand, Ethan. Uh, so that you can play around with it and see what it's like, uh, you know, and, and make sure that uh, it, it, it performs as well as we uh, expect it to. So, um, but uh, I think that's, that's a, you know, a nice uh, kind of talking point of, of new ingredients, you know, uh, especially for Chris, like, you know, you've, you've been kind of dealt with a certain amount mountain uh, variety of, of hops uh, in you know in New York we you don't have access to uh, all of the the, 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 the craziest newest uh, hops that are available that are obviously the driver of so many uh, you know beers and IPAs at this point um, you know Citra mosaic Simcoe uh, I wonder if you can talk about you know kind of where things stand, you know, obviously we've had a lot of the classics and stuff uh, and they've come a long way, just as, you know, Ted was saying, they've come a long way, but, you know, what, what, have, what, are you, what have you seen? What do you see as the progress and what are you 
what are you seeing right now that's coming into fruition um, that that you know maybe you're excited about that has a you know an equivalency to um, you know uh, the, the Cornell? Is there a, is there a hop breeding program? Um, you know, can you talk to that? Yeah, so we'll be we're going to touch on that next week with uh, the hop growers of New York a little bit, but I can I'll touch on it right now just a little bit. Um, we are working on something. Um, so any good positive vibes, good communication from the brewer's side, your guys' end over is going to help out. Um, once we do have a little bit more information on that, we'll definitely be sharing that. But that is something that is is hopefully coming to fruition. It's getting set up, I guess, is the best way to put it right now. Um, on, you know, other ends of it, you know, we've have, you know, we've, we've been able to garner some good relationships with the, the different breeding programs out west with, uh, you know, the USDA breeding programs at Corvallis and Prosser. And we've, uh, we've got a trial plot and a commercial trial plot for three different hops right now um, in the state. And that's going to continue to grow. Um, these, these three, one of them, well, two of them are still in the elite trial, and one of them will be in a commercial plot to go out to brewers this year. That's still kind of under the USDA and the Hop Research Council's kind of jurisdiction, so they'll be kind of controlling what happens with that. But um, we'll hopefully be able to, you know, this time next year, we'll be able to report on that. And there's one one of those hops we're, we're pretty jazzed up about. It's uh, not only really high yielding. It's doing very, very well just about anywhere as it's been grown, um, but it, it could compete with some of the top level hops. Um, there's some other information. Yeah. In a year, we'll be able to share more on that. But uh, I think one of the cool things, you know, we do have a, a public hop that's been released for years now that has kind of taken the entire industry by storm. And there's a lot more of it being planted here in New York. And that's that's cashmere. Um I think that every time someone tries a beer, uh, a beer with cashmere in it and I'm around, um, I try to listen in and they all, they only have good things to say about it. It's uh, it's one of those hops that competes with the big citrus Simcoe mosaics, but I think it lends better to the consumer side where the flavors and the mouthfeel and everything of that hop, it just, it does better. Um, I mean, we, we've had great success with it in, in selling it, not just from our New York side, which has sold out for two years, but also, you know, stuff from, that we're bringing in from out of state too. Um, so we're going to see that one grow. Um, one of the other cool things that we've been working on a lot is, is using this new thiol development and uh, working with labs out west and collaborating with them to come up with hot blends to be able to compete with those big sexy hops, if you want to call them. And uh, it's, it's quite unique because it takes a lot of the guest game out of say like, Jason, I know you, you're going through a lot of different variations of hot blends and uh, with mixing them in the beer. What we're able to do with this is, is really like <clears throat> you could fingerprint what a Citra, Mosaic or Simcoe does and you can make the same fingerprint and almost just about make the same exact hop by blending different hops in, uh, you know, the in a blending tank to before you pelletize, basically. Um, so we have a lot of that going on. And it's to be honest with you, it's been very successful. Um, we're kind of, you know, yeah, it's it's something to look out for. That's all I could say there. Um, you know, and there's a lot of other things being worked on here in New York with, with equipment and upgrading that and getting new products within the state. And because of all of this, I mean, a lot of the farms that are really um, gung ho and they're looking to do this full time or do it as, you know, part of their, you know, full time regimen, I guess you could say, even if they already have a, a full time job is, you know, they're expanding because of these things. Um, and, uh, you know, so I can say thank you to all the brewers that are on here too, because you guys have all been great to the New York industry over the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we look forward to the continuing, to be honest. Um, yeah. And I, so I want to just have a little bit, maybe a little bit of clarification on your side. Um, you know, you're saying we, and you're, you're kind of talking about these uh, larger uh, kind of aspects of the industry. Right now you're wearing all of your, uh, New York Hop Guild uh, swag, um, which is your company, but there is also the Hop Growers of New York, which is an offshoot or rebrand of Niha. Uh, right. Kind of talk about the two, and when you're when you were saying the we and talking about these different products and stuff, are you talking about the Hop Guild or are you talking about the Hop Growers of New York? 
kind of talking about the entire industry, to be honest. I mean, um, the the varieties is the entire industry. The, some of the products and the developments that we're working on is kind of the guild. Um, the Hot Brewers of New York is, is uh, you know, yeah, an offshoot of Northeast Hop Alliance. We're the New York sector. So that way we, we kind of bro- not necessarily broke off, but um, rebranded the New York branch, I guess you could say. So that way we could lobby for the New York hop industry um, in, in, a, in, in its whole, basically. So, and, and that's just, you know, it's, we've been working on it for a while. We're getting a lot of traction right now and um, things are just about finalized. And, uh, you know, that's where kind of the breeding program is coming from and some of the other things that we're working on. So we're pretty, we're pretty jazzed up about that. Um, guys like Chad Meggs, John Gonzala, Conrad Fink, those guys are helping to really lead the charge with this as well as uh, Steve Miller technically is retired, but um, I think that he's a little too partial to the industry to, to walk away altogether. So he's been a great help as well. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think one of the, the things, unfortunately, we didn't see with uh, you know, COVID coming on uh, last year was the, you know, the, the in-person version of this uh, event uh, that was going to be held uh, in 2020. Uh, and we were going to have, there was going to be a whole room uh, focused on New York ingredients, New York beers. Um, and, uh, you know, we were, we were going to, uh, you know, obviously, I think, take things out to more public and get it out there. Um, one of the things I'm seeing as a brewer, um, you know, as I've, I've kind of started playing and talking ar- uh, around the state with other brewers is that it, you know, the, the current license uh, dictates and it, it changed uh, last year, went from 20% uh, of New York ingredients to 60% New York ingredients. Um, and, you uh, you know what what that kind of did uh, was make some people get the dual license uh, so that they could have a base of uh, 50 barrels, um, but other people, uh, you know, what I've seen is that p- people haven't actually pulled back on their usage, uh, and in fact, I've seen a, a lot of uh, brewers uh, increase their and brewers that aren't even. Um, uh, you know, ones that are specific uh, to the farm brewery and they actually just might have a microbrewery license. So I think the quality has shown and, you know, we're, we're, you know, some of these, some of their base beers that may have Cascade um, and uh, uh, some of the other more classic hops, people are starting to incorporate it and, and realizing the benefit of being able to uh, drive to Batavia or to the Southern Tier or to the Hudson Valley or to Long Island. And, and interact with their, uh, their farmers. And, you know, I had really high hopes in 2020 to, that this would kind of become even more uh, as we had this room and everybody uh, from, for the, the conference would be able to go and see the beers uh, that are being produced and see the, the ingredients. Um, so it was a, you know, one of many, uh, things that, that, you know, COVID obviously disrupted, but, uh, you know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, like, how have you seen the other parts of uh, COVID affecting you, uh, your company, and your uh, industry uh, specifically? Um, Ted, I don't know if you want to start, um, you know, what's it been like for you? Well, first of all, uh, you know, today we're, we're making world-class uh, malt, in my opinion, but I think it's proven uh, in New York State. Uh, all the malt houses uh, have got their own niche, I think, at this point, and they're making some. We're making from honey malt to all kinds of crystals, uh, chocolates, all kinds of roasts. We've got six row, two row. Uh, the industry, New York State malting industry, has got great varieties now that are available uh, that have been doing well. Uh, and uh, I, I think any brewer that's out looking for something can find a, a New York grain mm-hmm. to suit their needs. Um, and with COVID ca- coming on, I mean, uh, when it first hit, uh, uh, the lights went out. I mean, the world was coming to an end. Uh, orders canceled, no, no calls. Uh, very scary situation, uh, I think, for the whole world. Uh, but 
I felt, uh, you know, a little, uh, a little activity in May and June, uh, it started picking up. And by July, the, the brewers, I think, have adjusted and started hand delivering their beers, whatever they needed to do. Thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, it started my business back up again. And uh, we're, we're rocking and rolling now pretty heavily on, on all aspects of roasted and uh, all the base malts, everything needed. So we're, 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 it was a little scary in the beginning, but I think we're, we're, we've come out of that tunnel uh, and I'm hoping everybody is doing well. And uh, uh, without the brewers support and ingenuity and being creative and how to get their beer out there, uh, we could be in some trouble, but we, we, you guys have chosen and made some great decisions and we're bringing this whole industry right out of the, right out of the depths of COVID. We, we did lose one um, malt house, 1886, uh, due to COVID. Um, what what is that? What has that been like? How has that affected um, the their farmers? And have you? What has that done for uh, you and and the other uh, malt houses in the in the state? Well, it, it's it's a unique unique situation. Uh, the largest malt house of New York State uh, closed their doors. I, I think COVID might have played a role in it, but uh, I, I'm not gonna you know, speculate there, but with them closing, uh, I had a lot of growers call me, uh, needed to get rid of their grains. So it's gonna take a little while to gain the confidence. We, what we don't want is the growers to stop growing because they don't think there's uh, uh, a, 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 somebody to buy it out there, but there's plenty of uh, locations they can sell that to. Um, and our business, uh, it increased our base malt uh, twofold. Uh, so it was unique in the way of, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, it, it was bad for the industry for them to close. First of all, uh, everybody uh, needs uh, large volumes and they were 60 ton a week system. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we're doing well. Uh, we're keeping up at New York Craft Malt. I've talked with Dennis and others. We're busy. You know, we're, we're, we're able to keep up. I, you know, there is some waiting time right now for some products, but I do believe we're, we're handling it well. And, uh, and Country Mall Group, uh, you know, they have their, that's where the growers can go to sell their product. Um, uh, so they're, they're 120, they're 125 ton a week system up there. Um, so, uh, with them closing and COVID, it's been a, a very interesting transition, and and I'm not sure where when the dust settles where we'll be, but I think we're handling it pretty well right now. Yeah. What about you, uh, Chris? What I mean, how's that? How's everything been for you over the last uh, year and change? Uh, pretty interesting. I was actually in New Zealand when everything happened up here and everything shut down. So you didn't just stay there. <clears throat> they they wouldn't let me. Um, it was a little nerve-wracking to be honest um being down there and then coming home to the apocalypse i guess you could say um so yeah i mean the first couple of weeks i was actually looking back through some stuff uh yesterday and how things changed and i think it was like a three-week period and it was just i was like holy crap things were moving so fast but at the same time like it felt like you know months had gone on you know every week just seemed like it just was so slow so you know we just I don't know. I just started grinding. Um, we made everything work the best we could and uh, put more hours in to make sure products were going out the door and it worked out well. You know, uh, March was March and April were a little, a little scary. And then, yeah, I think it was about May when things started, uh, you know, picking up for us as well. And, um, you know, due to you guys being able to ship beer and, and people being a little less you know, scared, I guess, uh, you know, they weren't as timid and also just different, you know, different ways of being able to do stuff, things opening up, um, at least being able to go to the grocery stores and not, you know, people not freaking out about that, you know, it, it was, it was horrible. So, you know, through the entire year, we did, we did really well. Um, you know, our, our, you know, our entire lineup of what we offer grew big time, you know, and I think that the New York sector was actually one of the biggest growths. Um, and that's why we have a lot of new stuff going in on, uh, for our guild growers basically right now in New York state. And, 
uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't thank everybody enough, to be honest. I mean, the, the support was awesome. You know, we didn't, we didn't have anybody calling us up, freaking out about contracts. You know, they call us up, you know, they, they, we, we could walk through everything and talk it out and come up with a conclusion for stuff, which was great um, to make sure that, you know, you know, we couldn't change the past, but we could change the, you know, we could change the future going in the growing season, whether it was, okay, we're not going to string this field. We're not going to string this variety. And it ended up working out pretty well. So um you know, kudos to the brewers being able to figure that out too and, and work with us. Um, you know, we got, we got really lucky with that, I think, you know, so we did extend contracts out and, and we made it a little easier for, you know, everything to make sure that it worked for, you know, everybody. And, and it was just a, a huge collaborative effort, I think. And, and that's basically what needed to happen. Um, and we're still looking to do the same thing, you know, this year because, you know, there, there are still effects of the COVID going on. So, it's still a, a little bit of a learning learning process for everybody, I think, you know, and one of the big things we touched on this the other day, Jason, it's like, well, I haven't, you know, me and Ted both, we haven't been in New York City for a year, you know, we haven't been out to breweries that it, really at all. I mean, we've done a couple collabs and everything, but um, some of the stuff we have coming up, we're not going to be at the breweries and it's, you know, it's a little depressing to be honest, it's, you know, with most of our relationships being, you know, very close with the the, the people that we work with and, having those close ties and not being able to see them in person and, and uh, talk to them and see them on a regular basis. It, it kind of sucks. And it, you know, I, I'd say that it probably has uh, affected us, um, you know, a little bit, you know, it sucks. And, you know, hopefully it's not too overwhelming when we do get to see everybody. That'll be great. We'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of beer to get us over <laughs> that anxiety. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think, but I think your point of, of, you know, you, you guys getting down to the city or to the other cities um, uh, is, is spot on in that, like, you know, being able to, being able, being able to have this communication and this relationship uh, in such an immediate uh, nature versus, um, you know, working with uh, West Coast Farms, who I'm sure are great, it's also on the West Coast, or it's in New Zealand, or it's in Germany, like, you can't just uh, do an easy uh, weekend trip. And I, you know, I, every summer I spend the week uh, just traveling around upstate uh, to visit you guys and like uh, seeing what the latest and greatest is and what's going on and how things are affecting you and hanging out. And, um, you know, and I think, I think that's an important uh, part of uh, the whole I idea of, you know, having local ingredients is to, to one, be able to give that feedback, uh, you know, feel like I can talk to you and be like, hey, you know, I want to, you know, we were talking about the uh, Fuggle, uh, you know, and I know it's not the one on the, like the sexy hops right now, but uh, what we've got, uh, you know, from what we got last year from Skinny Atlas Farms was like, oh man, this is, this is amazing. And so it's like, what do we need to do to ensure we get that? Um, or if we want something else, like, you know, the hops are, you know, not as much as the, you know, kind of the seeds maybe, but they, they are changing. You know, we, we were excited to work with the Homa and you're telling us that it might not uh, be in the ground much longer be just because it's so difficult to process. Um, so having this, this kind of one-on-one -on -one nature uh, that we can uh, and visiting you is extremely important, I think, uh, for both, both parties um, so that we can really, uh, you know, get a sense of, of what's, what's working. Like if, if something's not growing well for, well for you, or uh, it's having, uh, you know, uh, pest issues or whatever, uh, or it's not yielding and it's not worth it, then we can be like, okay, what, what do we need to do as a brewer uh, to make that worth it for you? Both, you know, both you guys and, you know, Ted, for you, it's like, okay, I want, I, you know, I think the thing is, you know, and Ethan was asking this earlier, is like this new variety of, of uh, Excelsior Gold, you know, what, you know, is it a base or is it a specialty? It's, you know, I think one of the, the cool things with you is that it, it's so much dependent on what your uh, kind of, um, you know, creativity and as well as the brewer's idea of what you want. Like, 
we can go to you and be like, hey, we want this. You know, when, when we've gotten some of these roasted malts, we're like, okay, can you pull back on this? We like, we saw this, can you do this? We like this, you know, these uh, certain uh, specs and, and whatnot. And I think that's uh, huge. I mean, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about, you know, the, the interactions you've had, um, you know, with farm brewers, but also like, is it is it extending? Are you seeing, I don't know if you can tell or always tell, but like, are you seeing this grow beyond just uh, the farm brewery and that this farm brewing is, is growing past the license class and it's more about uh, just brewers in general, um, you know, and those interactions that you're having? Yeah, um, this, this is a very unique industry and uh, I've been very fortunate to be in it, part of it and being accepted in it. It's, it's, it's camaraderie, it's friendships. It's, it's not just an industry where you're buying and selling. Uh, I've made so many new friends uh, by, with this business. Um, when I first opened up, uh, you brewers are quite quiet. Uh, I didn't hear boo from anybody. So I thought I was making great malt. Uh, I thought everything was fine and dandy. So it's, it's, it's really, uh, uh, you guys really need to tell us what's going on. You got to, we need constructive criticism. And uh, over the past years, I've been listening to the ones that will talk to me uh, and adjusting as I go. Uh, this is, uh, it's, we have a way of manipulating the grain in the malt house in many different ways. And if I'm not hearing or none of the malt houses are hearing from you guys that, you know, try, you know, we're having a little issue with this and this and that. Maybe we can make some adjustments in the malt house uh, to make those uh, quality adjustments. And so uh, the first couple of years, uh, you know, was, was a tough go for everybody. Uh, but I think now that, uh, you know, we have made great friendships, we've got open conversations going about the quality. Can you make this for us? I've been listening. I think we all have been listening and we're trying to make what you guys want and need uh and what was the last part of that um that was good <laughs> okay I, right. I rambled on too so you know <laughs> um yeah i don't know chris do you want to talk about you know uh the, the relationships and you know maybe maybe speak on where the the hops are going um how much i don't know if you can tell but how much is uh new york uh farm breweries versus just uh, straight commercial breweries. Is it going all in state? Or are you going out of state? Yep. So we, um, the communication is, is huge. You know, we're, you know, I'm, I have a farm and, you know, I kind of work for the farmers that we work with and it makes it, you know, we, we hope that it's making it easier for, you know, the brewers to be able to communicate with one or a couple entities, I guess, to, uh, give the feedback to the farms. And, um, over the last two years, I think it's really helped. I mean, some of these guys were growing stuff and wanted to continue growing something um, that wasn't selling and wasn't worth anything to, to the brewers. And, you know, with good communication, we were able to take that out, but also, you know, give feedback to the brewers to like, let you guys know. It's like, well, if we put this in, you know, you're going to see a price point up in this range because, you know, it just doesn't yield that well, or it just, it, 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 it's more, it's higher maintenance crop basically. Whereas we are getting into some varieties that do really, really well agronomically. And, um, you know, some of them even being cascade and, and cascade sales are probably some of our best, if not our best in, in New York. And, um, also taking that communication with guys that are, you know, we're, we're buying from out West. And if we have those varieties and we're able to, su you know, support those contracts from here in New York with New York hops, you know, getting those hops in front of guys and, and, and gales and being like, Hey, you know, is this going to work for you? You know, and if it's not, let's figure something out. And that's where some of our style development has been coming into play, being able to take um, and tweak things just a little bit where, you know, say like we'll use Cascade, for example, here in New York, you know, we get a lot of, you know, um, melon or even grape or apple characteristics where you don't get as much of that, you know, grapefruit or lemon character that you get from out West. Um, I feel like it's a more depth of flavor, but it's not. It's not your traditional that most people would see, but being able to utilize some different blending techniques, it really helps. And then, you know, beyond that, it's, 
you know, the, it's not just farm breweries. It's uh, breweries that don't have farm brewers license or guys that just, they want to use local or they're looking for a high quality product. And I think that's what it comes down to the most is, is uh, you guys need a high quality product and that's what we're trying to bring to the table. Um, and that's been really well receptive and that stuff's going, you know, to multiple States now. And, and even we have some stuff going out of the country at this point in time as well. So it's all over the place and, and we're getting good feedback and, and we're, we're hoping that's just going to continue to grow. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I, there are a couple of questions. Um, uh, Alex from a brewery called strong rope. You may have heard of that. Ooh. Alex. And it's about Excelsior Gold. He's still there. Alex, you there? Unmute yourself. Well, if he's not there. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. I was doing CIP in the brewery right now. So um, yeah, I guess the question I just, I hadn't heard much about the, the Cornell uh, pilot program and whether they had run the Excelsior Gold through that system yet. To Um, do you know I'll if they that. brewed with it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Excelsior Gold has been in, I think it's been four or five years development. And normally uh, it takes a good 10 years or more to develop. Uh, but Cornell has actually been sending, uh, having one growing season in New York State. Uh, I've been a, a location several years in a row for it. Uh, and then they send samples over to New Zealand and get another <laughs> growing season. Uh, but we don't have enough of it now that uh, is, they're still propagating it. Uh, we don't have enough now. I, I, I would like to malt some, but I don't even know where I can get it. So it's still early in the stages of, of how that's uh, transpiring. But I, I'm, I'm being very optimistic and I'm hoping it's the, uh, you know, uh, the, the grain that we need in New York State. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I think the and the next question is from John from another brewery called Strong Rope. So, <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, hear from Chris and and Ted, and um, I, I haven't checked the full list. I can't remember if Dennis was on on this one or, or if that's the malt uh, later. But um, just you know, is there a demand from breweries that aren't New York? farm breweries have you heard from them working with you because whenever i'm heading upstate for for leisure um i'll keep an eye to places that have a farm brewery license but i've seen places without that also promote like a beer that they make with new york uh or with local grains and hops and i've seen it down in pennsylvania too because they don't have a as robust as a as a farm program but something to keep an eye out for and i just wonder what demand you're seeing out there well, I'm, I'm almost to a third of my business is not farm brewing licensees. Uh, so it, it's the quality of product I think is bringing out the others and also the local board challenge. Uh, it's an old way of saying it, I guess, but the local, the locality of it uh, to the breweries means a lot. And uh, uh, the brewers, uh, uh, many are committed to having at least one local beer on tap at all times and, and the relationships, uh, I do deal with several breweries that they don't even have a farm brewing license and 100% of their beers are my malt. So it's, it's, it's growing. And I'm sure it is with Chris as well. Yeah. Um, I haven't really done all the statistics to keep up with, you know, who's farm brewery and everything at this point in time, but uh, 10, 11 months ago, the last time I really got a chance to look through it because of COVID I had downtime, obviously, um, it was about 80% of all of our New York state hops were going to dual licensed or non, um, non farm brewery licensed breweries. Um, so it was a, it was a pretty high amount, to be honest. Um, I think a lot of that was, you know, we were able to, um, fill contracts for, you know, Cascades and Centennials and Chinooks and stuff like that, Willamette, um, that they were getting it from another supplier, you know, out West or wherever. And we were able to do that, you know, here in New York and, and the quality was there for them. And again, I think that's what it, it seems to always come down to the quality standpoint. And, uh, so for everybody, I, I'd say that that's, you know, the number one thing. We've got about five minutes left. 
um, if there's any questions. <clears throat> if not, Jason, yeah, I guess you all can kind of wrap and kind of give your thoughts of, of the, the future of what you, what you see coming down the pipe. Yeah, I mean, I, I can start off just in terms of the brewing, um, you know, with the, with the license being at 60% and, you know, uh, what, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm more interested in seeing is that, you know, going forward and what we're seeing from other breweries, uh, you know, farm and non-farm alike, is that they are making these 100% beers. And I think that's where... Uh, I, I want to see the farm brewing go. I want to see people working with that. Like you can, you can do your, you know, your, your license, um, you know, whatever you need to, whether it's dual or sticking to the 60%. Um, but in terms of the marketing and, and where we, I want to see events go and competitions go is, uh, and, and what we're going to try to push is beers made with 100% New York ingredients. Um, because I think that will really give, uh, a full sense of what the capabilities are of of the of the, the, the of what we're able to do with New York ingredients. Um, you know, we've been entering competitions for a while and and doing doing well and 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 getting the recognition that I I think uh, the New York ingredients uh, deserve. And I want to see that on a larger scale and would love to, you know, every. Uh, festival that's in New York has some type of New York state component. Um, because I think, you know, I think that's when not only will the brewers start to see that maybe haven't necessarily jumped in, um, you know, because there was a, a preconceived or a, a past perceived notion that the quality wasn't there. And as you know, both Ted and, and Chris have mentioned, and you know, I have seen firsthand, and, and many brewers have, is that that has changed. That we are past that at this point. So now it is it is about working with those ingredients and figuring out what you can and can't do, or what you you know, or and really, there's there's nothing you can't do um, besides maybe some certain specific uh, hop things, but maybe that's even going to change um, as, uh, you know, the new varieties, these uh, blending uh, techniques come in. Um, so that's, that's what I'm excited about. I think that's what we're, we're where the brewing side of things are, but um, I don't know if you guys want to talk about that, uh, Chris. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, where I see the industry going, I think it's going to go up. You're going to start seeing as it already has happened with the, the, the hop farmers, you're going to see some more probably fall off. Um, people that either aren't, it's not that they're not um, fully committed. It's just, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into running a business. Plus if that business is a farm and uh, trying to get it out there. And then also, um, you know, probably working full time, you know, if uh, I probably wouldn't still be farming myself if, if my job wasn't within the industry itself, to be honest, it was, it was very difficult. Um, but I think you're going to start seeing acreage amounts go up. You're going to start seeing a higher quality standard um, with the hops in particular, and you're going to start seeing more and more interest. Um, like I said, there's there's a lot of USDA public varieties that are really interesting. Um, some of the work that Steve Miller's done over the last two three years with the um, with the hedgerow hops or the heritage varieties that have been going through, you know, there's some cool stuff there. I'm not saying that, you know, they're going to be up there competing with the big sexy hops, but I think that that's something to think about and to look at. And as beer trends start to change a little bit too, that might fit into some of those bills. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, IPAs are always going to be there, but I think there's going to be some other beer styles that are going to, you know, obviously they're already coming on strong. So, um, we'll start seeing that move a little bit. And to be honest, it, I think that with the quality out here, where it's headed, it could spark some interest from people out West to allow us to do some certain things, but we'll see, you know, that's, you know, that's still, I think down the road. Um, we do need to get the breeding program going. Uh, the nice thing with that is it at least gets us started, but we also have to remember too, that might be 20 years until we get something out of it, but you know, it, hopefully it gets started soon. So that 20 years isn't, 25 years or 30 years down the road. So, you know, we'll see where that, we'll see where that goes, but yeah, I think that we've got a lot of exciting things and things that we're working on here at the guild, even that, you know, is going to be able to be very helpful and, and, you know, we'll see, we'll see what comes of it, I guess. Ted. Yeah, just quickly, you know, uh, I think the future is quite bright uh, for everything. Uh, 
beer ingredients and you guys are making some awesome beers uh, as well. But uh, from, uh, from, the, from the seed is getting better, the growers are getting better, the malsters are getting better, uh, you're getting roasted malts, you're getting uh, flaked malts are, are almost here. Wow. Uh, there's gonna be everything that you guys want local uh, if you uh, uh, choose to brew a local uh, ingredient beer, uh, there's anything you guys want is out there. And before we end real quick, cause uh, Bill has a quick question for you, Ted, since you're. Okay. Hey Ted, it's Bill over at Heritage Hill. How's it going? Good, how you doing Bill? Good man. Um, <clears throat> I just had a quick question regarding any possible new varieties. Uh, what are the chances of you rolling out uh, a little bit lighter two row in the near future. I had spoke with your wife about it on the phone, but I had never had a response to you. And I love what you're doing. Love the Pilsner. The pale's just a little too dark for, um, you know, New England IPAs for base malt. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what color are you trying to aim for? Or what, uh, what lobby bond or? Uh, the Pilsner, you know. The Pilsner is not, is, it's not what you need? So I, I, I like to, I don't like to use, um, entirely Pilsner in, in the hoppy beers because you get a bit more, um, you know, greenness and a bit more, uh, you know, green time, I should say. So your, your beers take a little bit longer and um, stay greener a bit longer. So I do blend in some Pilsner, but I don't like to go above 40 or 50% just for that reason. There's a bit more time for it to, um, for, for the hop character to not be so uh, polyphenolic. Okay. So just a lighter pale, you know, two row. Um, I didn't know if you had anything else in the works. Everything else has been great. Um, cool. Love, love cool. using your guys' malt and stuff. And until right now, I didn't know anybody was interested in something a little lighter on the pale side. So that's what this is about. You know, we uh, have this discussion and it'll show up at your door. You'll see. Cool. Yeah, I'm trying to bottle bourbon barrel aged stout. So I've been kind of listening and this bottling trellis is kicking my ass a little bit. So <laughs> a little bit of the two. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Jason, our time is up. Uh, Chris, Ted, thank you so much. Uh, I know we could probably go on and on. And as Jason said, um, you know, next year we're, we're going to do this live at the Albany Cap Center. The reason why we're moving is because it's a larger space and uh, we are going to have a separate room so that you all can go through the hops and have those conversations and see the malt and smell the malt and taste the malt and do all of those things that, that we can't do through Zoom. Um, I will mention too, as you talked about, um, you know, New York State beer and you're using New York State ingredients, Heritage Hill did win a Great American Beer Festival medal last year using New York State ingredients. And I think that that's pretty, that's pretty it says a lot about how far New York State has come um, both on the brewing side, the malting side, the hop side. I mean, it's really coming together. Uh, I want to thank today's sponsors, of course, Magliner um, for being the day sponsor, the session sponsors, Ironheart Canning, Precision Fermentation, um, and Drink Tanks. Um, we will be recording this, so all of these sessions. So if, if any of you miss or come in late, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I, I put a link on there, and this session will be up um, a little bit later today. So thank you all. Uh, the next session is understanding how and where to invest your profits, um, which is happening at 2.30. Um, and, and that's going to be a pretty interesting conversation as well. So thank you, everybody. We appreciate uh, you being here. Thanks. Thanks, thank Paul. You. Appreciate it. Thank you.